Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Boz, and welcome to Tuesday Night. We are here to talk about if you're human, like I am, and you've had a binge. How do you get back on track? What is the protocol that I use once people do that life thing where they do something that had all these good intentions and then they crash and now they're way off track? Welcome to the Dr. Boz Show. We reverse medical problems with healthy keto living. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Glad to hear that, <laughs> glad to see that you can hear me. I am uh, having uh, no technical problems that I know of right now. So thank you, everybody, uh, for being my, my crew check for sound. We are going to do a couple of uh, traditions here on the Dr. Boz Show, which is number one, check my numbers. Uh, we use data here on the Dr. Boz Show, and I am actually really excited to show you some of my numbers. Um, I've done a pretty good job of uh, my fast this week. I have teenagers <laughs> that are going here from college, and I will tell you that it's a lot harder <laughs> when those temptations are high. Uh, so I, I'm actually thankful to be um, at the end of this fast. Oh, yeah, there we go. Because, um, I don't know, it's just hard for me. So I'm going to show you my numbers, and then I'm going to sync this up and show you my dashboard. So yeah, uh, ketone or glucose of uh, 59, ketones of 3.1, because I have a couple of announcements that I'm going to use um, as a way to show you how the update is doing, but I have to synchronize these numbers really quick uh, with my dashboard. Um, yes, there are updates uh, for those of you that are using the Keto Mojo dashboard. Um, I am just going to do that one more time. Uh, I have used this dashboard in my uh, classes where I lead groups of folks where if, if I'm mentoring somebody who's a cancer patient and I'm trying to coach their whole family through it because nobody that's struggling with cancer should be on a ketogenic diet alone, I would encourage you to do this with other people. Uh, thank you, Deb, for calculating my DBR, 19 tonight. Yeah, I did a good job this week on my fast. I had a workout yesterday that is probably the first one in 10 days. I just, life. Um, so I'm your perfect example here for what happens when um, when your, when life doesn't go perfectly. I can be the best teachable moment you've got. So I'm synchronizing both of these uh, meters so that my dashboard turns out to be correct. So just give me one more second. There we go. And now I can refresh this dashboard and show it to you because there's been some updates in the those of you that left the, left the class, the 21-day metabolic kick, and you hopefully have your own support group and you're using your own Keto da Mojo dashboard because that's how we make a difference. That's part of how uh, you fall off the wagon <laughs> is when you have to tell somebody when you have a support group. We're going to get a little bit more into that tonight, but let me show you. Um, let me show you this one. Yes. So here are my uh, here are my numbers, and let's see if I can refresh this page a little better. Yeah. So if you have been following this uh, dashboard, you'll know that one of the things that we chirped about when we talked to Keto Mojo was hey, when we're checking numbers, they would use the daily averages to, um, to show what, uh, what their, what, you know, what plot was on this uh, graph here. And now we have a, a much better plan where it uses the actual data. So if you're averaging the average blood sugars and you're averaging the ketones, and then you're trying to average your Dr. Boz ratio from the whole day, that does not that is not helpful for the way we were using the, the numbers. So now we can sh uh, the dashboard. I don't know if I if I blow it up, it didn't seem to stick. So maybe let's see if I can get it to go. Mm. So I could zoom in with a let's if, see if I change this to a seven days. Um, let's go seven days. I think it'll be prettier when I do that. So yeah, now it's got my updated ratio there. The glucose of well, that's not the last glucose. This is the one right before the last glucose. I think if I push refresh one more time, it'll be there now. 
I'm always impressed at how quickly it does update. So when it's not there on the last one, so let's, let's look at what the numbers are. Um, so if I look at these numbers here, so you can see the glucose of 57 and then a glucose of, that's right before my live. So it hasn't synchronized with the last numbers yet. It might be because I have all this stuff turned on. <laughs> oh, you know what? I put that on do not disturb. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna talk to my phone until after the show is over. That way I also don't get a phone call during the show. Um, anyway, so let's just use the number right before the, the show, which was a glucose of 59 and ketones of 3.1. Um, in the past, it would average those numbers. And we are so excited that Keto Mojo has updated this to do the point by point data, which if you're in a group and you're looking at averages uh, over a day, it really is a little frustrating to say, well, what is that? Wait a minute, that's not what really happened. So you can now hover over these numbers and do a little better uh, data point. Here I took two ketones. One, I got an error of 0 0.4 and then I took it like 30 seconds later and it was 2.3. Um, I did have a glucose that matched at the same time there, but it's not showing up on this one. I synchronized both of them, so we'll see. We'll see at the end of the show if I can get that other one. Well, I just said it can't synchronize because I'm not, um, my, my phone's not talking to it. Well, let's get back to our show. We do have a couple of announcements, and I just want to also scroll through and say hello. Gene Wagner's on tonight. So is Deb. Hello, Lance. Um, and then Karen Edwards, all of uh, some favorites. Hello, Patrick. Uh, so many of you that are uh, helpful for um, for not just showing up, but also being the reality check that I often need to. That yes, uh, you can do keto, but when you do keto alone, it's uh, it's not nearly as effective. <laughs> and I don't mean that your chemistry is not as good. I mean that when you're doing things like, yeah, you've found yourself in a fit of a moment and you reach for that popcorn or you have a, a vacation planned and despite being on um, a good um, um, environment, a healthy environment, when you headed on vacation, all of the food that you thought you would say no to, um, well, the food you're saying yes to is, is not tasting very good because you're not really in control of what's in the fridge, you're on vacation. And so you just say, oh, forget it. I'll just, I'll just eat with everybody else. And one meal turns into two meals, turns into three meals. And before you know it, you have uh, landed at a place where <laughs> does your body remember what a ketone is? So we are going to use some of my protocols for when folks fall off the wagon. What uh, do they do? What do I ask them to do? Um, I'm going to open up my drink for the night and put a few ketones in. I do... I'm happy to say that the uh, the ketones that I uh, am putting in tonight are pucker up, and I do have some raspberry on order because we are no longer uh, out of stock on our raspberry. And I will check my numbers at the end, not because I need help raising my ketones. My ketones are already high; they're high because I fasted. But I'm not always this good, folks. <laughs> I count down to the show. You showing up and joining me helps me. Uh, which brings me to the point of what happens when when people are um, when they're stuck when they're not doing well. So let's go over to the lesson. We're gonna swing back and give you some announcements a little later on, but let's get to the punchline here. So, uh, what is my binge protocol? So again, binge protocol doesn't show up um, every day of the week. It only shows up when uh, you've actually fallen off the wagon. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, other things that uh, get in the way are when you swirl into a vacation where one little bite led to a whole bunch more of processed foods. And then you check your numbers saying, I didn't have that much to eat. I've been really good. It was only a little bit. And you wake up and you just, your numbers are definitely not where they should be. And um, that craving, that want for food is really heavy on your brain. It's really reminding you, oh, my idea of having, you know, a high fat food that isn't very, um, well, the word I like is palatable, which is the official word used for when f food is sweetened, whether it's through a natural sweetener or erythritol, that palatable food seems to be what you think about, what you're craving. Um, the first thing that I uh, use for, the binge, for my binge protocol looks a lot like what happens when you're in an emergency room 
and or you're the first EMT on the scene and you're just trying to do damage control. So the first thing I like to think of is stop the bleeding. <laughs> what do I mean by stop the bleeding? I mean, you should fix your chemistry. <laughs> just get the chemistry, get ketones back in circulation. Uh, uh, usually binges, I mean, if you've been at this a while, maybe your binge only was a bite or two, but the rest of us <laughs> had the whole bit, box of popcorn. The first bite wasn't so bad, then you were only gonna have one more kernel, and then you look down and the movie's half over and you've helped your husband eat half of the box. And you're like, oh, I did not mean to do that. <laughs> I did not mean to do that. Uh, so the first step is uh, when you kind of shake off, uh, number one, you're not gonna fix this problem overnight, but what you can do by adding ketones back to circulation is um, you can suppress the cravings. You can improve the way the brain functions. Um, when I've had a binge, I'll also have swelling in my legs. This is something that happened when I, um, when I was really insulin resistant is I would easily put just have a thumbprint at the bottom of my shin. And I, of course, I would had taught medical students that, well, that, that only happens when people have, you know, like heart failure or they've been inflamed for a long period of time. And when I could put my own thumb on my own shin and leave a shin thumbprint uh, after pushing for like 15, 20 seconds, I, yeah, I realized, yeah, I'm not 20 years old anymore. <laughs> I, I have been around the sun a few too many times. And as soon as I would start adding those carbohydrates, my insulin would uh, chase those carbohydrates right to right out of my bloodstream. But it was at a price that my body would be really swollen. <clears throat> so when I say stop the bleeding, I really do mean that, um, that the, um, the ketones in circulation are going to help um, in a chemical way to slow down uh, that, that binge. The second thing that I point out is what you should not be doing. And this is the mistake that people do is they, they have this guilt syndrome and uh, ask me how I know. Uh, then they step right over and say, I'm just gonna do a quick fast. I'm gonna start fasting right now. Or they say, you know, I've been doing so well at this restricted eating, this four hour window I'd been doing it for two weeks and, and then I fell off and it was two or three days before I could do it. So they try to reach back uh, for the best eating window they've ever had as if to say, I really need to just pinch, uh, pinch my eating window, slide it to the hardest time possible. And, and then they wonder why it's not only, a, uh, it's just a few days later before they ha have fallen off the wagon again. Uh, so I do not want you to do that. I do not want you to do that, that's not right. So the first step was number one, stop the bleeding, add ketones to circulation. But the second thing in the protocol is to assess the situation, feel for a pulse. So what do I mean by that? I mean that you should assess your situation, which is what were you searching for? Uh, what was the reason for the binge? I spend a lot of time when I'm one-on-one -on -one with people uh, helping them uh, look for this, helping them say, yeah, the, the hot moment is over. Uh, now that your body's feeling the, the chemistry that feels good again, uh, calm down and I need you to just feel for a pulse. Just look around and say what happened there. I have some worksheets that are part of the workbook um, or whenever you take one of the courses, I use this as a handout to say, study yourself, look at yourself. Uh, and I'll be honest, it's really hard for people to do that when they're in the moment of a binge. When I have, um, when I've seen the best success for this, they usually have a partner <laughs> that can help them ask these questions, but you must trust that partner a lot. Uh, it is not somebody who can enter into one of these vulnerable moments where you can admit what you're, what is really going on. Um, uh, let me show you, I have, uh, I have a, um, I have uh, a worksheet over here that I use. One of them is uh, looking at your, the, the food craving thoughts. So if you can see this, it's what the workbook looks like. Um, and I have them say, all right, um, what time did this happen? And what was really going on um, when, this, when this situation hit? So for this situation, if I look back at, well, let's just take the last binge that I had. So what's the date? No. <laughs> it was probably about uh, six days ago. So I'll put, oopsie, let's try to uh, get the writing one here. 
Um, so I'll just say six days ago. Uh, and what happened was, um, well, I went to a movie. I went to a movie with my husband. It was fun. Uh, it was movie night. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but we've really enjoyed how we watch movies at home. And I haven't smelt popcorn in a long time. And as soon as he said, I'm going to buy some popcorn. Are you okay? <laughs> now, I had my Redmond salt with me. I knew that I would, if I just had that along, I would be fine. But the movie got um, a little intense. And this happens to me at home, too. When, it, when a movie gets intense and I don't want to deal with it or I don't want to look, uh, I even like scary movies. But even when the emotion hits, I can feel me want food. And it happened in the movie theater, and I was sitting right next to husband, so I started eating the popcorn. Uh, so was it a craving or was it hunger? One of the ways we look at that is um, how long does it last? Cravings are short. They're going to last less than five minutes. Hunger will stick around for longer than that, 15 minutes. Now, when you're keto, it's, it's shortly after that 15 minutes that they don't really struggle with it. But uh, in that moment, I totally know it was a craving. As soon as the movie scene changed, I had this lovely popcorn in my mouth and I thought it tasted lovely. But if I was looking at what, was, uh, what were some of the things that, um, uh, this is ways that you can make it go away, but what were some of the emotions that I was feeling is that there was a bit of stress in the movie. Um, I also know that it was a distraction. Uh, the, the movie w was being used as a distraction, but also the popcorn was part of that uh, ritual that, I, that people do at a movie. And I've been good about it before. I have gone through several movies where I didn't touch the popcorn. It is usually the first bite that gets me and then I spiral downwards. And then the next thing I know is um, it's, it's a bigger problem than it should be. I should have just stopped, but I didn't. So stress, I'll put boredom here. Um, the other thing was is the ritual. Uh, so all of those are th ways that I've told my husband to help me. And most of the time he does a pretty good job. But I think it'd been a long time since he had popcorn too. <laughs> so we did this and we had a bunch of popcorn. And I knew instantly that I, it, it was, it was going to be too much for me. Um, it, it wasn't what I should have done. But it gets worse because just like anybody else on the way home, he's like, well, you know, do you want to grab some ice cream? Again, something I usually would say no to. But that first bite led to the second bite. And it was probably the ritual again. This is something we used to do a lot when I, before I really was a firmly keto. And boy, I said yes when I should have said no. So some of the ways that you really uh, look at how do you get out of a cycle? <laughs> I don't think I could start meditating in, in the middle of the movie, movie uh, screen. I don't think I could have gone. I mean, I could have gone to the bathroom. Honestly, anything to like really switch uh, the way your brain is working. So you can be, if you're in your own home, maybe you could do this in a movie theater, you can splash water on your face. And you say, that's weird. Yes, it's weird, but it does reset the brain. It's a moment where you reset the brain. One of my favorites, um, so if I put salt on my tongue, I don't know if you can see that, that's a great way for me to usually fix it. And I had my salt along, but the salt plus the popcorn won. <laughs> so... When I look back uh, at some other things that um, I do, there, I think I left, oh, I don't know if I left this one on here. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, I was gonna show you the left-handed loops. Left-handed loops are another thing that I've done in a movie theater when I was first figuring out how to say no to popcorn. Uh, I learned this when I was helping uh, people with addiction get through their first support meeting, like whether it was AA or a church group or, um, uh, Al-Anon, I would go with them and as soon as they would start to do their behavior of stress, I would hand them a piece of paper, I would put the, pe you know, we'd have, have the lined paper ready for them and they would start just to do the left-handed loops, left-handed loops over and over and over again and they would get through the moment, they would get through the moment. So I've done that in a movie theater, uh, it actually works really well for me. I can still watch the movie. I start to circle with my left hand and there's just something hypnotic where I, I stop the craving. It's really, it's really useful for me. Um, I don't know if it works for everybody, but it does work for me. Here's another thing that this is the part where when you're having a, a craving, 
you, if you can invite somebody into your pain that you trust, um, they can help you with this. When I've asked people to do this on their own, they can do it, but it's not quite as honest as when somebody's helping them with it. When the craving's happening, if you can get somebody who's, who's in this with you to really write this with you, I, I love what happens here. So I tell them to say, when the craving starts, mark the time. So you would fill in the time here, like, you know, eight o'clock. Um, and then every 30 seconds, you do a couple of things. What is the desire level you have for food? So one being low and five being high. Uh, let me just uh, do that. So I would say during the first few minutes, uh, it's high. And then I have them in cursive, really important you do this in cursive, what is on your mind. And when they start to write stressed, um, uh, worried about you know, health problems or something. And when they're writing in cursive, that is a huge part for releasing how the brain thinks. This process is not something you should practice the first time when you're having a craving. You should practice left-handed loops. If you can write left-handed, uh, this I just wrote that with my right hand, but if I could write left-handed with in cursive, it is even a bigger reset. So there I might try to say, um, uh, uh, I don't know if I, what would the bat? So you see what's happening there? So when you write uh, left-handed, that cursive writing really slows down your brain. And that is, again, what the same thing is happening when you do the splash with water. The splash with water is really quick and it, well, it's uncomfortable. But actually, so is writing left-handed with what you're thinking. So if you can find yourself in the moment, this works really well. And especially for my patients who've, who've had trauma, who've had uh, issues with, um, uh, you know, really getting past uh, their carbohydrates as the way they cope with life. Um, so that worksheet is in all of my handouts for the courses, or it's in the workbook, uh, a really great way to, um, um, to, to look at where their, you know, what, what their brain has been doing. So I want to go to this slide and talk about uh, when people are on, uh, when I'm asking them to take their pulse, to, to look at what happened. Step one of take their pulse is look at the emotions around the decision. Look at where your brain was. Try to find something that has slowed you down. But the second thing that I like them to do is I want them to look back at the keto continuum and say, where have you been? Remembering that this first few phases of you know, one through four is really the chemistry set that they work with. Uh, that's not most often where people have been, where they binge, they get past that. Uh, it's usually in one of these areas where this is where people live, okay? Keto continuum five through eight is, uh, the, the five is 16 hours of no eating, eight hours is how long their window is. The advanced part is when they've removed the coffee, the cream-filled coffee from the morning. And if they couldn't do that, well, then they, um, they counted it in the hours that they eat. Um, and then this little line right here, I, I actually am really careful to show this to people that uh, this line looks like a tiny little line right here. But when you go from eight hours to one hour of eating, you do not do that overnight. It is a gradual process. That's essentially what uh, we teach in the courses, that this looks like it's a tiny little step. It's not. You've got to slow it down. You've got to do several things that really allow you to get from eight hours of eating to one hour of eating. But it's somewhere in there that usually people relapse. And they, if they've been following along, they know what that looks like. Um, what I see people do is they slam down to here. They say, you know what? I did a 48 hour fast two months ago. I'm going to quickly hop back over and do another 48 hour fast. That's not going to work people. That is not going to work. You are going to stress out your emotions by pushing, uh, a skill set that you're not ready to do. I tell the story about, um, when people, when a baby babbles, when a baby babbles, it is, uh, the skill set that they are comfortable with. And they will reach for the next word and then they'll go back to babbling. 
and then they'll reach for the next word and they'll go back to babbling. This is the same skill, the same process that happens as we learn a skill set in adulthood. So learning how to fast, learning how to say no to food, learning how to say, hey, uh, my emotions are definitely driving why I had that fit. And I like it. I like hanging out in this emotional fit until you start to see some of those health consequences come back. Uh, in my support group this morning, uh, we were talking about what's what's something you know that says you should back off of the, um, it, that you know you need to like man up, get, get back to where you used to be. And one of the gals was saying, you know, I used to have joint pain everywhere. I went keto and all of this joint pain disappeared. I couldn't believe how great I felt. But as soon as I start to have these cycles where I'm eating too much, I'm eating too many, too often, my, my window is no longer clean, there is one joint that starts to hurt. And it's the sentinel joint. If I don't reverse things when that first symptom comes back, uh, then it's five joints hurting within a week. So as you look at people who fall off, they binge. Some people, it's only one or two, pe one or two days of having these binges, but some people, the binge leads into four or five weeks before they can say, oh, I gotta figure this out. How do I get back on board? Again, number one, add ketones until you figure it out. Uh, the second step is take your pulse, assess what makes you eat, what is pushing you. Go back to the place where you fell off the wagon and really analyze what happened and use that chart. You know, wh what were you feeling? Where are you at with that? Uh, there are several other steps in the workbook that go a little more into it. But what I don't want you to doing is reaching for the crash and burn saying, I did a fast once when I was in a group of people and I did awesome and I felt great. <laughs> Yep, that was not when you were not there. That's not where you are right now. Don't do that. Uh, that really does lead to it leads to a, a, a pile of people not doing well because you you rope in other people just like what my husband did. It's not his fault. It's my fault that I said yes. But had he not bought the popcorn and then he had not said ice cream. Yeah, I totally fell along. But as soon as one person falls, the next person it's easy for. But the reverse is true too. When one person gets back on board, if you're in, in community, it inspires the next person to do it. So don't, don't run away, don't run away. Um, all right, so let me go back over here uh, and um, let's see here, yeah. So if we look at this, um, this is our, uh, the keto continuum and what I see people do is they are um, usually somewhere here or somewhere here, and then they slam down to say, but if I go without food for 72 hours, everything is gonna be better. Not true. What I ask them to do is find where they were last safe. Where they where on this continuum were they last at where they hung out there for a while. Now, I, I, I don't know if you can see the little red lines that I have around this area here, and that's because I really like that um, from four through seven for people to hang out at. Like that's where people should live. Uh, eight's in that too, but I'll tell you, most people can't live at eight for too long without, um, um, without crashing and burning. And this is the place where I find if, if, you can, if you can not crash further than four, so when people are at the beginning, they you know they eat every two hours. Then we get them to the 20 total carbs. They accidentally miss a meal, and after they accidentally miss a meal, after they're keto adapted, I ask them to go to keto continuum number four, and I want them to stay there for seven consecutive days in a row. Part of why I do that is for this crash and burn, that when they have gone through the cycles of binging and crashing and binging and crashing. I know that if they had practiced this to the place where they had a pattern. Now, I honestly don't think seven days is a pattern, but that's the minimum. You have to do it for seven days to at least find any rhythm. But most of the patients who have two meals a day and they stay there just really holding on to what it feels like to be in two meals a day, they've done it for at least three weeks, 21 days. They're in that three weeks They've gone through weekends, they've gone through weeks, and even if the rest of the world celebrated, 
they figured out how to keep one meal in the morning and one meal in the afternoon. Um, not, not that uh, it doesn't also lead to, um, you know, we want you getting through the temptations while staying at this level, while staying at keto continuum number four. If they've had that pattern in their, in their babble, in the place where they practice the skill, they advanced, and then they fell back. They practice the skill, they advanced, and then they fell back. That's a normal pattern of eating. That's a normal pattern of behavior improvement. And if they stayed at the two meals per day when they were progressing, first of all, I know they're really fat adapted then. Their body is ready, their endocrine system is, is working towards really being able to surge when I need it to surge. And when they crash, when they have a binge, they can go back to two meals per day while they look around. They look around and say, okay, can I hold this for seven, for, for 10 days? So let's go back to my little protocol here saying, okay, binge protocol, stop the bleeding. Yes, add ketones. Number two, assess the situation. Uh, figure out where, uh, what happened during the binge and then remind yourself where the last place it is that you were stable and then go back to that. How long do you go back to that? You push reset for a full 10 days. Uh, looking at, um, yeah, looking at what, what were you searching for? What was happening during that time when you were binging? And then making sure you've got a list of the places you get pleasure that are not food. This is super important, mainly because it is such an easy place for us to get pleasure in the 21st century. That pulverized, processed food where industry has spent a ton of time making sure we know exactly what's going wrong with your body, exactly what's going wrong uh, to make you crave and want for more. They know it to an, a, a, it is a science. It is not random. It is very much calculated that that is how you end up addicted. That's how you end up with this craving cycle. Um, so find pleasure other than food. And again, we work at this when I'm working with a team or when I'm working with a patient. Um, but finding where where your anchor is for the last uh, success, that's the that's what I was saying. If I hope I hope that somewhere along the way you spend at least three solid weeks uh, where you didn't just say, oh, I did this and then you skip to the next one. You really see that pattern where you were successful at. And this is key. Uh, 10 days for the for people who have been through a binge, that 10 days isn't an accident that it's longer than a week. It's got weekends built in. It's got the, the work week, at least one full work week in there. Um, what I see so commonly is patients say, yeah, doc, I've been here before. I did three days of this and, you know, I usually start my fast on Sunday. So, or I did that with you a couple of times. So I've, I've been back to two meals a day for three days. Now I'm going to, I'm going to fast with you. And I'm saying, don't do that. Don't do that. It really does lead to another cycle of binging. They never really get past the binging. When I look at people who are progressively improving their habits, where they come in and they're usually a hot mess, like most of us when they are insulin resistant, and then we teach them these skills. We teach them how to count carbs. We teach them how to get through that first um you know, place where they're eating fat, where, where, where they're building up that endocrine system. They're really learning how the body, what it feels like to feel satiety through these fat-based hormones. That process takes time. And during that time, you know, it's like Karate Kid, wax on, wax on. They're, they're practicing a skill that doesn't seem to make sense until you get to the moment of danger, until you've had a binge. And now I need you to slow down and go back to a place where you can be predictable. There's another handout in here that I, I really like. Um, let me go to that really quick. Um, uh, where did I put that? Oh, on my iPad, there we go. It is, um, oh, I shouldn't have thought, here we go. I'm like, I had it open a second ago. Uh, it's this one. Yeah, keto, here we go. Okay, so let me show you this. Um, all right, so on this one, uh, it's it's actually keto continuum number seven, um, where you can write this in, but um, I have them document what time, here we go, 
what time uh, oh, not a racer I need to find. Oh, what time they wake up I have them document their glucose I have them document uh, their ketones um, and then I have them document their Dr. Boz ratio all three things that the keto mojo does for you but this part where they where they dot they write down what time did your eating window open up uh, um, when when I talk about eating window for the people who've fallen off who are si trying to find their way back to a, a, um, a solid you know a solid eating cycle the time where they open up their eating window is if your coffee has anything except salt in it that means any sweeteners or any calories that counts in your eating window so they write down their eating window and then they document what time they're eating what was the time of day that their eating window closed now in keto continuum number seven you're trying to narrow the eating window smaller than eight hours keto continuum number six does this uh, workbook as well where they they shade it in and what we're looking for is we get you a two-week cycle this goes a sunday through saturday a sunday through saturday and how well did you hold the eating window now, if it's beyond the eight hours, you can always, you know, fill that in on your own at the edge of the paper. But what I like to see is that their eating window is consistently that, you know, six to seven hours every day for those for those two weeks. And there is a very helpful process in the in your mind when you're documenting your own progress, when you're keeping track. I mean, honestly, keeping track. What was my first bite? What was my last bite? And where did I land? And if you're looking at your morning ratios and you're looking at your morning glucose ketones, it really can teach you a lot. Uh, I, I love those worksheets. I think they are better than a therapist sometimes because the patient is learning about their own process. Um, so as I as I look at the binge protocol, um, I know this quite well because I've done this too. Okay, when you get out of a rhythm, um, I've been in a pretty good rhythm for the last year, but if you go back, I mean, I, honestly, since the first 21 day course, I've been in a pretty good rhythm. I've had a few times where I might have had a day or two where I've fallen off. If you go back to before that, boy, that whole year of moving, of, you know, getting the families situated at, across, hey, moving at 50 is really hard, people where kids are in a new school, I'm trying to figure out my new life here in Florida, uh, and I just had a lot of sympathy for myself. <laughs> and every time I felt stressed, I used food to, to say, oh, you deserve this. Oh, you'll be okay. You're all right, you're pretty good. Um, it really was when I got in a group of people where I said, all right, let's do our best for 21 days. And then afterwards, even when I would fail, I didn't fail anywhere close to as bad as I had been. And so I think this is the part where when you progressively improve, the danger is it takes so long when they crash and it takes five weeks to get back to your support group. It takes five weeks for you to check in with your buddy, your, fr your friend, to look at your numbers. Uh, that's really where people's health problems just tick in the wrong direction forever and ever. Um, you know, I always, uh, we, t we say this to our boys, we say this, I say this to my team, that people underestimate what they can get done in a day, excuse me, they overestimate what they can get done in a day, and they underestimate what they can get done in a year. That if you, if, if your goal is steady, to slowly improve these processes, that for a year you hang out at an eating window of six hours a day, or maybe seven hours a day, but it's solid. You're not cheating outside that. You're really holding. And when, when I see people crash and burn into the cycle where they keep binging and crashing and binging and crashing, they don't do this protocol. They leave the ketones away saying, I, I'm just going to make ketones. I have so much fat, I'm going to make ketones. When you add ketones to circulation, not only does your brain work better, but the appetite is suppressed. And the mitochondria that have kind of been a little lazy, they haven't needed to use a ketone for a while, you can, they start doing their job. And while the, while the mechanics of your body are back at work, we need the psychology of your, your mind back at work. And that means, how do you address where, how you got there? What was going wrong? 
Who is your support group that can help you walk through things? And then that self-realization by documenting in a place where you can look back over time that I really need you to make it at least 10 solid days of doing the right thing before you advance to the next level. Do not reach for those fasts. Do not reach for the best cycle you've been at. Go back to a place where you really are solid. And when I see people do that, they have this steady improvement, steady improvement. And, and that's how we reverse medical problems. Okay, we're going to go over to your questions, so be sure you're typing them in. My team is putting them in our, our little document. While I, Before I hop over there, I am going to uh, just uh, give another reminder to say thank you for everybody who did send in your videos um, for our 21-day course. We have lots of reviews, but also the folks that wrote, a, wrote, the, um, um, wrote in for... Um, the you can see the videos if you if you scroll through at the bottom some of them are just so awesome uh, and then you can see the ones that that typed in those uh, messages as well anybody who submitted that does get uh, a a, uh, a gift from me so i they all know about that i'll let them show show you that i also want to say a special thank you to the folks that come to my support group on tuesday mornings it is every tuesday at the pin chasers here on north armenia so 4809 north armenia every tuesday at 8 a.m it is free to anybody who wants to hang out ask me questions i i leave it about 9 15 and have a meeting that starts at 9 30 but i'm i had some new faces this morning and they are getting a sneak peek at what I'm going to be talking about at KetoCon. I'm taking off a really advanced lecture, which is to really teach about cholesterol, not in the glib way that says LDL cholesterol is bad. No, we are really diving into the advanced biochemistry of what happens to cholesterol during a keto ketogenic diet. And what do you really need to look at as a as a person trying to say, am I doing myself any harm for having all that fat? Um, and the answer isn't just oh no you're fine that's not the answer you gotta you gotta learn about this process so i keep practicing the message the folks that come allow me to use their labs as i try to teach through it uh, with the slides that we've been using and i'm just really thankful so if you haven't signed up for ketocon i really do uh plan i do not plan on having a booth but i plan on being there standing there answering your questions so the fastest way that you can hang out with me is going to be well, Tuesday mornings at, at Pin Chasers, but that's only an hour at a time. Um, I'll be at KetoCon and I'll be there to answer your questions and to get to know the folks that really are trying to become part of the keto community. So I'm, I'm looking forward to all of you that are coming. Uh, let's hop over and look at our questions. Um, let's go here and... Um, all right, we've got some questions in the bank here. My team is keeping me up to up to date. So yes, this is also where you're gonna get your questions answered. I know several of you have written in on Instagram and uh, on Facebook. And every time I try to add one of those uh, tasks to the week, I can do it a couple of times before it's just one more thing on my schedule that I don't, I, I'm, I'm struggling to have the consistency with. So keep showing up here and I will answer your questions here. The other places I'll, I'll keep trying, but be nice to me. <laughs> All right, so should we eat in a four-hour window long-term, or is base metabolism always 16-8? Oh, Kai, that's a really good question. Um, uh, I will tell you your numbers are going to be the ones to tell you that. One of the things that I loved seeing in the uh, 21 day was every one of the students was hooked up to a Keto Mojo dashboard. So I could totally geek out and go in and look at people's numbers. And as you would watch their blood sugars start to get better, we had a couple of challenges where one of the challenges was we said, you can eat as many sardines as you want at any hour of the day for as many hours as you want. But the only food that you can eat for these three days is sardines. And I would watch to see what their sugars have done. So their eating window is completely wide open. Uh, but what's fascinating is in those people who are keto adapted, uh, especially by the third day when, when their cholecystokinin is, is primed, when their body is able to really send the signal of satiety with a high fat meal, uh, their eating window is usually a lot more narrowed than they typically were before the sardine challenge. 
So when people say, what should I be eating, a four hour window or a, 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 you know, a, can I keep it at eight hours? I have many people who are so insulin resistant that when they narrow their eating window to eight hours, uh, at first their morning sugars are better, at first their ketones are up in, you know, in the 1.2, 2.0, I mean they really have pretty good ketones, but it doesn't take long for their body to really equilibrate to that and reset. And once their body is reset to that, that, um, that morning sugar that is not in the 70s, that is not in the 60s, and their ketones are not, not elevated, they're, they're low, like 0 0.2, 0 0.4, then I'm going to ask them to stress their metabolism a little bit more, especially if they're not at ideal body weight, especially if they've had insulin resistance for the better part of a decade. Uh, by by allowing that morning fasting sugar to bump up into the 90s or 100s and the ketones to sink back down to a 0 0.2 or 0 0.4 every day, every day, every day. That says you're you're not stressing your metabolism. 16.8, I, I mean, my teenagers could live at 16.8 and stay healthy. Most of my patients cannot live at 16.8 and stay healthy. 16.8 is where they learn to cope with how do you say no to food? Especially when I have them say, your 16 eight hours needs to be that the eight hours slide towards sunrise and you don't eat when, after sunset. When they have really been practicing that and their morning fasting blood sugars are greater than 90, greater than 100, um, and their ketones are very low, that's when I start to say, all right, I need you to advance. Instead of an eight hour window, I need you to try a six hour window. And then they hold there for you know, six weeks, three weeks, whatever it is. And they realize, okay, what's your morning sugar at? What's your morning ketones at? And when their morning sugar is not in that, you know, 60s, 70s, or, or 80s, uh, and their ketones are 0 0.2, then at some point they need to slide that eating window closer uh, if they're trying to reverse medical problems because a, a Dr. Bob's ratio of greater than 100 in the morning is not going to reverse those medical problems. You're stable, um, you're probably not going to get worse really fast. Um, I mean, we have a, we have a guy who is giving his report this morning from our our group, and he has been insulin resistant. He's had a heck of a price he had to pay, uh, where his insulin resistance led to a, a vascular situation where he had a stroke after a surgery, and that stroke um, has almost completely reversed by now. He's been coming to group almost two years, or a year and a half, I guess now. Uh, and he really has improved his health. It's just impressive how much better he is. But he gets up in the morning and his sugars are not 60, 70. They're, they're higher than they should be. And his ketones are, you know, 0 0.4. And he's doing pretty good things. But if he wants that to be a, if he wants his metabolism to be, um, to be flexible, to be stressed, which is part of how you heal, that blood sugar needs to come down and the ketones need to go up. So, the answer to your question is long-winded because it's a really common question. I get this a lot uh, and I'm trying to answer it not just for you but for other people that when people are at a four-hour window um, and then their life falls apart and they fall and they binge and they can't. Well then go back to whatever it is that that window was where you were last stable. Often it's eight hours and then you're at eight hours for those ten days. Then you're at seven hours for those 10 days. And what you're trying to do is slide the window narrower and more towards sunrise uh, in order to, uh, to watch to see when does your metabolism s uh, click back over to uh, metabolically flexible. I, I hope that answers your question. Does smelling food cause an insulin response? No, but it causes an incretin response. <laughs> So I haven't talked much about this. I actually warned the people this morning I was trying to talk about the incretin effect. Um, this is actually why um, Ozempic works is it has it's an incretin analog. It's a lookalike for an incretin. Um, the, but there is a, a cephalic phase of incretin. If you go back to last week's live, I think it was last week, uh, where I talk about um, what happens before they ever eat their food. Uh, is the, the incretin effect. Uh, and there is a cephalic phase, meaning as they smell, as they see, as they imagine, as they, as they anticipate food, 
uh, the hormonal process does start. It's not insulin, it's incretin. Um, I might be too advanced to do without some slides. I warned my, my, my the person that helps me make slides that we're going to have to figure out how to make that slide because I get that question more often now. Now, now that Ozempic is out there, there's a couple new ones coming down the pike that you're going to want to learn about. And we're going to have to be able to teach about incretin. So I'm going to need some pictures. All right, let's keep going here. Um, Lisa says, binges are dirty keto with high fiber, nuts, dairy, sweets, tastes, uh, su sweet tastes like the alternate uh, sweeteners. Would I still follow this process to get back on instead of my fat fasts? Okay, so with dirty keto, um, what I find is the cycle of what you're doing, that fiber, that nuts, that dairy, and, and then those, uh, those sweeteners, um, they happen, I mean, it's like a, a treadmill that starts out nice and slow, but as they add a bad habit, and you can call it dirty keto, but I'm going to call it a habit that's not giving you the numbers that you need. Uh, they add a little habit. They add a little another habit, then the next habit. So ask me how I know. I've done this too. Yeah. So there's nuts that sit on the counter. And then the nuts lead to um, a piece of cheese. And then um, the nuts lead to a piece of cheese. And then I don't do very well with the sweeteners, but it'll be, you know, I've I'll have my coffee without cream in it for 30 days. And then, then one day I just say, I just want to have the cream again. And it's usually after I've been having nuts, after I've been having cheese, after. I, so it's this, there's a escalation of how do I reset? And so when I look at the accumulation of the dirty keto, whatever you want to call it, um, by, by pushing reset saying, get ketones in circulation, start there. Usually my, if I'm checking my numbers, they hadn't been. I hadn't been making ketones. So that's step one. The second one is you really need to look at why are you reaching for those? Because I'm guessing you're not adding nuts because you're hungry. I know I'm not. <laughs> it's because I'm stressed or bored or, I don't know, feeling entitled. <laughs> All the stuff that's normal. But if I'm trying to reverse my weight if, or if I'm trying to reverse my insulin resistance, the next, the next bad habit leads to my next bad habit. And... And I'm totally human. I, I do that. Um, so I wouldn't go to your fat fasts right away. I would I would back up. I would really look at, I mean, again, the fat fast, like um, a sardine challenge, if you've been to the chorus and you've seen how amazing that works, that's great. But when I pe see people having these bad habits, having these bad habits, and then they just crash into something they know has worked in the past, it isn't that I don't want you reaching for a sardine fast over the next month. But when they quickly go to the sardine fast, they skip over the part where they recognize, why are you doing that? Why are you reaching for nuts? Why are there such easy, easy snacks in your, in your atmosphere, in your life? And that's really where you're going to be able to reverse these problems, not just one at a time, but really for the benefit of, of you feeling better. Um, all right. A couple things. Um, <laughs> uh, let's go here uh, all right so oops I went a little too high Dr. Boz any good advice on organ meat supplements well that's a good question because um, I just got done finishing a f filming um, a really good video it's probably going to take us another month to finish editing it but it talks about let's see if they're here I don't think I have any back here. It's all out at the front desk. Um, the one organ that I tell people they really do need to supplement is liver. Uh, so many people can't eat liver, and that um, that liver um, isn't uh, isn't nutrient dense and you know praised by most people because it's kind of good. It's really good for you. The problem is, let's go over here. Um, the problem is is most people don't like how it tastes. So there is, again, I don't put my label, I don't make a product that I don't take myself or somebody in my family doesn't take. My husband will not eat liver. <laughs> I don't know, he was like scarred as a child or something. So looking at, uh, this took me about two years to get to market because do you know how hard it is to get gas, grass-fed liver? <laughs> and then it's not just like 
fried liver. This is freeze dried liver so that the nutrient stays really good in it. And that's the supplement that I'll, I eat. That's the supplement that I would put in my body. Um, again, I don't like taking pills. I don't like taking supplements, but if I'm going to take it, it better be worth the time it's taking me to get the dang pill in my house and then figuring out how to eat it. Uh, so the only supplement that I've found worthy of doing has been the, the, the beef liver. There are some other organ meats out there that aren't terrible, but, um, I would stick with the liver ones and you're looking for the, the freeze dried stuff like, like what our brand does. All right. Johnny Appleseed or Jonah Appleseed. Um, any words of wisdom or advice uh, going forward after the sardine challenge? So it's really great uh, that when people have done a sardine challenge saying, well, what do I do next? What's what I get this a lot too. So sardine challenge does a really good job of of, of three things. It primes that the body for making cholecystokinin. Again, how much, how much cholecystokinin your body makes is dependent on how much fat you've eaten over the previous days. So people say, gosh, doc, I have those sardines and I burp and I don't feel good. I don't like it. They make me burp. I'm like, just keep going. The first day is because the previous fat that you had yesterday wasn't that much. Uh, and by eating only sardines, it really does prime the body's ability to make um, bile. Um, part of that's gallbladder, but part of that's liver. And it all has to do with how much your body's, your, your, how much you're swallowing for that fat. Uh, so by the third day of the sardine challenge, your body has some really good mechanisms reset. It's making ketones really well. It has lowered the blood sugar really well. And it makes cholecystokinin really well. The part that I see people crash and burn for after they do the sardine challenge is they like ward off like I've had my lifetime fill of sardines. What I would do if you're struggling, if you said if you did the sardine challenge with us and then you finished out the 21 day, we've had several folks write in saying, oh, you know, I didn't follow up with a support group. I thought I would, but I didn't do it. And now I'm kind of floundering. So what I tell people to do is if they if they get back into their rhythm, and they, they work towards 10 days of eating well at the place they're at and then push for a sardine challenge. So three days of sardines. Then after that, there is a minimum of five cans of sardines they eat for, the, for that week. Okay, so that, that usually means it's the first meal of every day for the next week. It's amazing how little they eat when you do that. The following week, I go to four cans. And the following week, I go to three cans. And what's happening is you're gradually saying, all right, when I took away all the, the social pressure of figuring out a menu and keeping it high fat, and then, of course, the can of sardines has good portion control, right? So all these things are wonderful. But then I push that responsibility back on the patient, and they're just not emotionally ready to deal with all that. Well, uh, start with the training wheels. Say, okay. The first meal of every day after the sardine challenge is, I don't care what you eat after that, start with sardines. Start with a can of sardines. And then the next week, you have to do it four days out of the week. And then the next week is three days out of the week. And what happens is that's a grat, I mean, they really have satiety. They really feel full. So the ability to eat past that fullness, it, it it's really hard to do. I mean, when you're when you have endocrine on your side, when the hormones are on your side, yes, I can eat through it too. I can push through and say, I'm just going to have what I want. But it's a lot harder to do that when your hormones are saying, oh, you can do it. You can do it. So I've had a lot of people write in about that. So I'm, I'm glad you, you typed that in. Um, they've been through the emails and I haven't gotten them all answered. I keep thinking, oh, we're going to have to address this in the next 21-day course uh, because so many people wrote in and said, well, what do I do now? So you took you took the pressure away from me. I got to answer it. All right, I'm going to check my numbers at the end here. Um, I do have um, something I would like to talk about. Instead of uh, showing you an end screen this week, um, I, I, I want you to hear about different ways you can help support the Dr. Boz channel. Because as you hopefully see, you're at the end of this video because something was helpful. Um, I hope you find this as a community. I hope you see that these are real people trying to get rid of real problems. And as much as I could be seeing patients one-on-one -on -one at a much higher volume, 
I take time to make these videos to plan out what, what folks are looking for and find a way to serve a larger volume of people. But um, uh, things like um, supporting Keto Mojo by using our link gives us a little bit of income, a little bit of feedback. So if you click the links that um, my team will put in the show notes here, um, I it, it helps our system, it helps our team uh, be able to keep the channel open. So we appreciate that. There's something called a card that happens on here and it, I think it's either up here or up here on the replay. Um, We'll try to put it in the card too. All right, so my ketones are, okay, 4.8 and my glucose is 50. So ketones 4.8, glucose is 50. Uh, when I get off of the live, I'll take a screenshot of my dashboard and put it over on the the, the community tab. So if you've got numbers, uh, you can uh, share with me, but I would love it if you, uh, help our system out by not only supporting Keto Mojo and the, they have done such a great job of building a dashboard that works for our system and it's free. It's free to all of you that want to run a support group, that want to have accountability through numbers. And I think there's nothing better. I mean, it really is the truth serum for saying, how is your metabolism doing? Should you be at a six hour window? Should you be at an eight hour window? I don't know. Look at your numbers. That's what we do at the Dr. Bow Show. That's a wrap for tonight. We will see you next week. And I appreciate all of your comments. I do use them to come up with ideas for what you want to hear about next week. So thanks again. I will 